Good morning. I'm Miranda Cox. I'm the senior warden. It's my turn this week to be the vestry rep. So I get to make a few announcements. That I mean, a few very brief announcements. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who, wait, I'm looking at my cheat sheet, who had anything to do with helping the service, the altar guild, Karen, the musician, who, the flower ministry, the ushers, the upcoming lectors. Thank you all. It takes everyone together to have a church service, which I did not realize growing up, but now I know. Um, so the announcements, the main announcements are all in the red door or in the handout, same announcements, both places. I just want to draw your attention to three things in particular. Number one, if you were thinking of calling the office on Wednesday, no one will answer. It's a holiday, Juneteenth, June 19th. So call on Tuesday, call on Thursday. Office is closed on Wednesday. Um, also coming up this week is the Columbus Pride Mass, which is Thursday evening, 7 p.m. at Trinity on Capitol Square. And we are still looking for Turkey Trot chair and co-chair. If we don't have chair and co-chair, we will have a very hard time having a Turkey Trot. So um, I think that's all I have. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries? Yay, come forward, please. Oh, good. <laughs> Happy birthday, Marjorie. Thank you. Well, I'm here. The hymns there and the hymns in the service leaflet are not the same. Are these right or are the ones in the leaflet right? I think those are right. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's well, name that tune. Name that tune. Okay. She'll start playing and you start singing. Happy birthday, Marjorie. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to say a prayer of blessing for our sister Marjorie on her birthday. Thank you. Sure. Let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant Marjorie as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When exactly is your birthday? Last Monday. Last Monday. It was, it was a book group, and I said, I am 77 now, I am old. And they all said, oh, no, you're young. So <laughs> it's a good group if you like to be told that you're young. Se yeah, that's a good <laughs> advertisement for book group. And 77 <laughs> is like the new 57, right? So... All right, what's in your leaflet is right. So actually I had something to say about um, our St. Albans Day celebration, not next Sunday, but the next Sunday. Um, so thank you all the people that helped uh, with signing up for the potluck. We could still use some more things for the potluck and it's in the uh, coffee hour room over where we're gonna have coffee after church and everybody's invited to that, but please, I can't do the service and the, and the potluck, but I wanna say I'm impressed with our good start. It's quite fabulous. And I also wanted you to know that we need uh, either to find in the church building or for people to share your grill with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a sign-up sheet in there that says, on St. Albans Day, I'll share my, my grill with Jesus and the St. Albans community. No pressure, that makes it a little more intense, right? But I have a young adult who's, uh, who's a sous chef who's willing to flip, and I think Sal may be willing to flip as well, um, burgers or, or chickens or something like that. Um, but we gotta have grills to do it. So somebody told me one time there were grills in the catacombs of the church. But if there aren't, and you have a grill that you would share with your faith community, that would rock. And there's a sign-up sheet that says, I will share my grill with Jesus and St. Albans in there. And lastly, I also wanted you to know that I reached across the pond to St. Albans Cathedral in Hertfordshire, England, which is the, the original St. Albans church. There was a, mon a medieval monastery and um, church there. Now it's a cathedral, the shrine of St. Albans where he was purportedly beheaded is there. You might have read about this in the red door. And I asked them if they had any unique resources that they could share with us to make us particularly cool 
to, you know, to be connected <laughs> to the original saint. And I got the greatest letter from the, from the uh, canon there. Uh, he sent, his name is, um, his name is Kevin Walton, and he wrote me back. He was so gracious. He sent me uh, a thing on a pilgrimage following in the steps of Alban, which I think we can do maybe next year. <laughs> they actually reenact the beheading of Alban with the children and puppets. That's wild, isn't it? Uh, not, to, not to play that down, but it, it's very creative. They also have um, prayers that are unique, and they gave us the recipe to the Alban bun, and they sent us a script uh, for the pilgrimage day to be used with kids and people of all ages. So I think we might, who knows, maybe we'll even do that this year if I can find a drummer. Karen? <laughs> you can find me a, a drummer. Great. So I'm excited about this. I'm going to learn a whole lot about St. Alban, and um, I think it'll be fun. Okay, let's begin our worship. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the lessons. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I named you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Hear what the Lord is saying to God's people. Today's psalm is Psalm 20. Uh, let's read it responsibly by half verse. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of God, Jacob, defend you. Send you help from his holy place. And strengthen you outside. Remember all your offerings. And accept your burnt sacrifice. Grant you your heart's desire. We will shout for joy at your victory and triumph in the name of our God. Now I know that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. Some put their trust in chariots and some in horses. They collapse and fall down. O Lord, give victory to the king. And answer us when we call. A reading from the first letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We are always confident, even though we know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. 
for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise day, night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, 
which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. From the very beginning, human beings have tried to describe God. Never ever satisfied by their descriptions. But there's something that has compelled human beings from their beginnings and compels us now to keep at it, to keep doing our best to describe what our experience with God is like. I mean, how can we ever speak accurately of our connection to God, our mission with God, how it feels or sounds, what it causes us to imagine or remember or to do? We might look for input on how to describe God from scripture. We might glean something from gatherings like this, and we might reflect on a daily basis. I hope we do. Um, in our daily lives to notice and think about what this is like for us, God's presence in our lives. So just as Jesus did, we discover that the most we can do is to say what it is like, not maybe what it is, but what it's like when we're in the presence of God. And that's what Jesus called a parable. We all give it a shot to say what God is like. I failed on Trinity Sunday when I said that in our human attempts to explain the mystery of God in three persons, I failed when I I didn't get a laugh when I said we are like a bunch of oysters trying to describe a ballerina. (laughs) Thank you, Miranda. That's why you're the senior (laughs) warden. So we keep trying to describe what God is and what God is like. We do our best, and God blesses our seeking, even when we, don't, when we don't get a laugh, God still blesses our seeking. But And Jesus, our rabbi Jesus, he was a lot more fluent than we can ever hope to be at describing God moments or God experience. And he, he did a great job today when he tells his disciples and tells us two stories. Jesus said, it's as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and then sleep and rise night and day. And lo and behold... Maybe Jesus said, lo and behold, the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. So this first comparison of Jesus uh, to illuminate what God's kingdom is like, he compares it to a feature of plants that is familiar to any farmer or gardener. The sower can carefully put the seed in the ground, but has little to do with its growing. No matter what we think, we really have little to do with its growing. Jesus tells us the sower has so little to do with the seeds growing that he or she can go to sleep through the process of sprouting and maturation. So what is Jesus saying? The kingdom of God is like a sleeping gardener? Or maybe the kingdom of God is like a gardener who sleeps through the whole growing season but yawns and wakes up just in time for the harvest. So there's the first story. And in case we didn't quite get that message, Jesus tells a second and says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows up, it becomes the greatest of all shrubs. So two stories, the growing seed, the mustard seed, in both cases, Jesus gives God 150% credit for the development of seeds into fully grown plants. I'm not sure I like that. It sort of flies in the face of our contemporary capitalistic values. 
So as you know, if you ask most successful people, what is the secret of your success, we'll probably get answers like passion, hard work, skill, focus, I have great ideas. Very few people are aware of their level of privilege and luck. <laughs> it's true. So if you're like me and you want to succeed, oh boy, I just got here, I'm your new priest, I want to succeed. <laughs> My natural inclination is to put in longer hours and more intense effort. I call it efforting, I'm efforting. But the parable of the growing seed, Jesus says, the seed grows of itself. Of itself, that's kind of weird. In Jesus' language, that's the same as our word for automatic. The seed grows automatically. And you know what, whether you're a farmer or a gardener or whatever it is I'm doing around my little place in German Village, we know it to be true that when it comes down to it, the mysterious unfoldings of germination and flowering or even of unfolding of a life, we're not in charge. We're not in charge. I always go back to this story. I have this childhood memory that I have associated with this parable for many years, and so you're going to have to hear it like everybody else when it's this Sunday in year B. So my dad was attending seminary um, in Wake Forest, and he and my mother lived in Raleigh where they leased an apartment for, from a really dear couple. They were, their name was the Mosers. I thought they were the Moses when I was a kid. Um, but I was born during this time. The couple also served as kind of a nanny team for little Beth when my mom, the nurse, was at work. And they were like family to my folks, and so we went back year after year to visit them. And I was so little, I didn't even remember them. I just knew these are the people. They loved you just like we love you. So from my perspective, though, the Mosers, they were like rich and famous. Their car seemed to be the size of a barge. And they had shiny uh, leather upholstery in their car and automatic windows. <laughs> and automatic windows were not standard at this time. Mr. Moser wore double-breasted suits and a variety of felt fedoras and smoked a horribly stinky cigar. And I still remember when I was a little older, when we went to visit, when Mr. Moser had this back and forth with my little brother Mark, who was absolutely mystified by the windows. He'd say, Mark, tell that window to go down. Go down, window, Mark would say in his assertive tone of a toddler, drill sergeant's eventually lawyer tone. <laughs> and to Mark's amazement, as if in direct response to his three-foot-tall authority, the window would go down. Now, Mr. Moser said, tell that window to go up. And you can guess what happened, of course. Go up, window. Go down, window. Go up, window. Go down, window. And I was only two years older than my brother, but even at age five or six, I was overly responsible, <laughs> priest-to-be, and was concerned that we were wearing out both Mr. Moser's finger and the windows of a million-dollar car. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way with seeds and plants, does it? does not. Child or adult, we cannot push a button and order a seed to change and begin to put down roots or put up stalks or eventually fruit and flower. And of course, Jesus and his disciples lived in the BMG before Miracle Grow era. <laughs> but even now, even if we claim to, we know that what makes the growth is not us. And if we think it's us, we ourselves are full of fertilizer. <laughs> we might be able to describe what the growth is like, but are we in command of the process? We know that we are not. So it's a good thing, I think, when it comes to spiritual growth and church growth, it's a good thing that our God has a green thumb and though it's hard to admit, though we do our best, God's kingdom comes within and among us as mysteriously and yet as reliably as seeds grow. But it's not because of our anxious insistence or our efforting. It's like with a sense of humor, Jesus says, 
reminds the disciples that the one waiting to grow what they sow, all you need to do is throw the gospel on the ground and go to bed. There's a pastor, a physician named Richard Debert who said, stop calculating, stop worrying about design and strategy, stop trying to crunch results, scatter what you have and hit the sack. And Christian tradition has interpreted the comparison of the mustard seed in a similar way. The itsy bitsy, have you ever seen those things? We used to look at them in Bible school. The itsy bitsy mustard seed can grow into the largest of shrubs, not because of human effort, but because this is what God intends for mustard seeds. Well, when we ponder these two parables together, we might take home the message that it is not our work to create the kingdom of God as if we ever had the power to do such a thing, but rather in the end, it's God's work to bring the harvest, to bring God's will on earth as in heaven. I have to tell you, this bothers me a little bit, and so I got up this morning at 5 o'clock and changed the whole ending of my sermon. (laughs) If we have no part in this, it makes the life of faith pretty easy on our side of the arrangement. And as great as a human hands-off approach might sound, it can't be that simple, can it? It can't be that simple, can it, to just trust that the world will mysteriously grow in line with God's intentions with very little participation on our part. This is one of those times, everyone, I'm telling you, I think that in the world of grace, more than one thing is true at the same time. God gets to do that. We actually do have a part, and as Jesus said, It is not about the seed and the soil. I think our part is about the light. This is the new ending of the sermon. We have some idea about the importance of light to plants, don't we? But we don't often think about how essential the light component is to the plants. It turns out it's the majority of the deal. In the late 18th century, there was a Dutch scientist named Jan Ingenhuis who discovered that plants carry out a remarkable chemical process called photosynthesis, meaning to create from light. Photosynthesis is literally the basis of life as we know it, literally. A byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen, which plants release into the atmosphere. And long ago, before there was us, and it was just bacteria and newbie plants evolving, there was very little oxygen in our atmosphere. No oxygen, no us. We owe our lives to the plants. (laughs) But it's about the light. Did you know that plants don't eat dirt? There's a whole new book about this. We pile on compost-infused organic materials that are mostly fluff but contain some minerals that makes plants grow better just like we wash down vitamins and minerals uh, with a glass of water. For plants, though, light is their daily bread. Light is their truest energy source. If we provide a plant with less than the amount of light it needs to be healthy, no matter what else we do, extra water, vitamins, minerals, begging. People put signs up in German village. Grow, darn it, they say. But no matter what we do, if there's not enough light, it will not make the plant healthy. The plant will eventually starve. And I thought about this a lot with today's parable. How can we comprehend, how could it be that God's coming among us is as if someone would scatter the seed and then go to sleep and the seed would sprout and lo and behold, it's all done and all we did was sleep. And I'm thinking... I can't come here as your new priest and say, people of St. Albans, let's all take a permanent siesta. No problem since God manages the whole deal. But there's actually our part. There's a mantra. I like to say this. It helps me a lot. I do what's mine to do. You do what's yours to do. 
We can't do everything. We are not called to save the whole world. What we must do is what is ours to do. And what we must do is to be in the light. We are in the light like a plant when we sing and pray and break bread together. When we do those things, we are in the light. We are in the light when we love God and our neighbor and ourself. We are in the light when we forgive and bear one another's burdens. When we do that, we are in the light. And we are in the light when we serve those who suffer from lack of love or safety or dignity or equality or shelter or food, all those essential forms of light. We are in the light when we serve. And we are in the light when we throw a phenomenal party and remember who we are, who we have been, and why it matters so much on St. Albans Feast Sunday. We are in the light when we throw a party. And community, I'm thinking, is the root system of our life together, a life full of meaning and hope and playfulness and joy are like the vitamins and minerals for our souls. So yeah, we can't take credit for the unfolding of a seed or flower or life, but we can partner with God by standing in the light. So like Jesus, we give God full credit for the development of us tiny seeds into fully grown plants. We give God full credit for when we become all that we and our church are, in cre are created and intended to be. We give God full credit. And while we do, let's be in the light and trust God for what happens next. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Kristen, our own bishop, for Beth, our priest, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present and for those who are absent, that we may be united in your truth and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joseph, our president, Mike, our governor, our legislators and city commissioners, and Ben, our mayor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live and work in this community, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We remember especially our caring and sharing partner for the month of June, the Community Kitchen, and we pray for Bill L., Shelley, Renita S., Tina K., and Mike K., Josh F., Ann S., Karen R., and Tom B. For those serving in the military, Jack K., Abby, Ann, Aaron, Peter, Jake, Tyler, and Virginia. We give thanks for your healing, especially for Gary C. For whom and what else shall we pray? For those in Ukraine and Gaza, Lord have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Mary, the mother of Jesus, Alban, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. Lord have mercy. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with Mary, the mother of Jesus, with blessed Alban and all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. God's blessing be with you. Christ's peace be with you. And the Spirit's outpouring be with you. Now and always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thank you, God. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you.